now we are next to Dr. Sanguinetti. So giving a very thorough introduction to the history and the controversy and introducing me to the word unhype, which uh, I'm very aware of. Um, if I may add a slight <coughs> personal uh, touch to that, I became a lecturer here in 2010 and my title was Lecturer in Machine Learning. And then I was promoted to reader in 2013, and it was still a reader in machine learning. And then I was promoted to professor in 2017. And at that stage, you have to choose a proper title for your chair. And uh, I didn't choose professor of machine learning, partly because there was already someone called that way, but also because I wasn't really very comfortable with being called professor of machine learning anymore. Uh, when I started in machine learning, maybe 12 years ago or something like that, um, there was something that people would call uh, old-fashioned machine learning. And uh, I think I do now old-fashioned machine learning myself, and maybe that's physiological, except that the new machine learning is what I was calling old-fashioned machine learning 12 years ago. It's come back. So what is it? Let's have a look. So before starting, there is huge amounts of data that have become available. That's really the big game changer. And there is value in this data. I'm sure Ben will tell us how they use our data to make more money to Amazon and so on. Um, you can't argue with the success of data science, statistics, machine learning. That's the kind of the less uh, trendy name of AI, really. And probably will continue. There's certainly been a transformative social impact. And, and not all of it is liked, or universally liked, at least. Uh, what I would like to say, you know, the thing that has really changed dramatically is the power of prediction. Okay? There are lots of questions that are not purely predictive questions. Say, I get the genomic sequence of a tumor, I want to understand what is the sequence of events that led to that tumor. To the, that, that is not a pure prediction task. We're not particularly better at solving that task with AI than we were 10 years ago. Um, I also think that you know, if we took a visitor from 30 years ago and we asked them, you know, here, talk to Siri, they would say, yeah, great, you've got AI now. That's, that's certainly true. Uh, I mean, I wasn't thinking that much about AI 30 years ago myself, but I think I would agree with that. But it's much more Star Trek than Star Wars, okay? So Star Trek, they have a very big computer and Dr. Spock says, computer, calculate the new, and the computer does it. It has a very good speech interface and uh, presumably also very good national language processing. Uh, but there are not that many robots that move around, not humanoid robots that interact in, in Star Trek. There's plenty in Star Wars. And you know, we've seen what happened to Marjota. We've seen also the, the, the robot cook that they put for about 15 minutes in the real kitchen and then they took away because <laughs> yeah, it wasn't working really. And we talk, you know, I, I don't do robotics myself, but my robotics friends tell me that it's not happening yet. And I think, you know, we, we have to agree when well, that's what I was referring to when we were talking about when I was talking about old-fashioned AI. Um, old-fashioned machine learning, we're talking mostly about neural networks. Deep neural networks are what are generating a lot of the excitement these days. The rise, again, of deep neural networks. You know, to some extent, deep neural networks started, or neural networks started as a model of brain function, and in fact, David Welshaw in this building, which didn't exist, but in Edinburgh, uh, was one of the first proponents. But that was kind of a simplified toy model of how you could have something classified based on a hierarchical structure. It was never meant to be, you know, the state of the art. And then it became kind of the state of the art, then they stopped being the state of the art, and then now they are the state of the art. So I'm going to actually explain a little bit about what prediction is and how it is done. Uh, but before, I want to actually point out the hype thing with a few quotes. And I entirely disagree with Vasilis that it is not true that all the hype is generated by non-AI specialists. It might be true that it is non-AI specialists that worry about robots taking over, but there's plenty of famous uh, uh, you know, machine learners that say really strange things. Uh, and we'll see a few. Well, the first uh, uh, 
the first quote. Yeah, so this is from Nature, arguably the most <laughs> re revered uh, scientific journal, and you know we work really hard to try to get our papers in Nature. <laughs> this is from an actual famous AI researcher, or machine learning researcher, Andrew Ng, who works at Google and previously was at Stanford and still has some uh, attachment, residual attachment to Stanford. AI is the new electricity. You know, electricity, everything in this room runs on electricity except for your voice. Uh, okay, maybe. That's my favorite. Famous <laughs> machine learner, used to do sensible things as well. <laughs> um, you know, there is a deeply anti-scientific trend in here. We say, you know, we should not try to understand nature, which is what we've been trying to do since the scientific revolution. We should just gather data and let the machine do it. Oh, come on. Well, I'd be out of a job if that was the case. So, uh, Considerably worried and not at ease in transition periods, <laughs> if that is the case. And uh, the final one is not a quote, it's actually, I don't know, does anyone, does the name Rocket AI ring a bell for anyone? Okay, so for the people for which it rings a bell, I was actually at NIPS, now it's called New Rips for obvious reasons, I guess. And uh, a bunch of postdocs decided to have a prank and say, oh, we'll make up a new company and they just completely, complete gibberish. Yeah? They, they had a talk of complete gibberish and they, they, they booked a room and bought a few crates of wine and they had millions of venture capitalists, capital in the evening for something that didn't have a product, didn't have anything sensible in it. You know, so that's, maybe that's the heart. So, okay, so let's have a look at how the thing might work. Yeah? So we said about prediction problem. So prediction problem means we have some input variables and we want to be able to predict something from that input. <coughs> and machine learning, or AI, is done in a statistical way in some sense because it requires you to gather a sample of pairs input and output so to learn what is the sensible map or function. So here we got an example, we have height, on the x-axis and whatever body weight on the y-axis and obviously there's a pretty good correlation and you know, a naive person might just want to draw a line and use the line as their predictor so if I get someone who's 54 inches now I'm going to predict uh, what, 130 pounds, whatever that is, that's a very weird unit. Um, how do I train it? Well I fit a loss function so I say the deviation between my predictions and the training data and the observed outputs is how bad the model is. I want to make the model as little bad as possible. I have two parameters because it's a line and I find those two values. What we could also do, this says, okay, we are making a very big assumption. We're making an assumption that there is a linear relationship. We could say, let's not make assumptions. Let's find a generic function. How do you do a generic function? Generic functions are not a very easy object to do. Well, we build them from little bits, what we call basis functions. So for example, we could think, let's take little triangles and combine them so as to get something that goes through the data as well as possible. Now, if you're going to allow the little triangles to be also narrow, you could actually approximate very well any function in this way. And you would go through the data perfectly. You would get a much more flexible model that is capable of explaining anything, not just linear. Right, but wait a second. We were talking about deep. What's deep about this? Ha! Huh. Deep. Why do we need deep? Because it's an exponentially more efficient than coding. I mean, the first time I heard that, I said, oh, wow, there's something really clever here. Let, let's see how it is really clever. Um, let, uh, how far can I count on the fingers of one hand? What's the maximum number, integer, that I can count contiguously on the fingers of one hand? 
probability? 31 if you start from 0. Correct, you would say 5, but you can count 31. 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 is not a particularly adequate number in a silicon <laughs> company. So, what, what is that? Well, I'm just saying that by making five consecutive binary choices, I can encode 32 numbers with five. So, whenever you arrange things in a tree, you have an exponential encoding. Log n is your depth required to encode n So, it's a sensible thing to do in terms of organizing your, uh, your data. But is it a good idea to have all of these triangles to go through the data? Well, it might not be. And in fact, it's not, you know, it's basically a glorified joint dot yeah? in that sense. It didn't work. You know, as we've seen, this very same idea was abandoned in the 90s because, well, it leads to very hard optimization problems. It leads to overfitting, which means, you know, you go through the data, but then you can't generalize particularly well. The noise in the data dominates your prediction. Coming back to our friend Andrew Ng, he, at the time when I was doing current machine learning, he had this statement about, you know, he had to teach a lecture about neural networks in his course in machine learning in Stanford, and that I have it from the horse's mouth, that's how he started the lecture. Um, Fine. I mean, people can change your, their mind. I mean, unless you are a British voter, of course. <laughs> it's not um, so I'm confident with Andrew changing his mind. Um, but the thing is that it, it, it cannot really work. So if you genuinely had functions that live in high dimension, the number of training points you need to constrain a high dimensional function is super astronomical, way greater. You know, a function in 100,000 dimensions, like a high-resolution image, way greater than the number of atoms in the universe. The thing, the catch is that somehow it does work. At least on some tasks, image language, it seems to work extremely well. And we don't really understand why. That's an open research problem, but fewer people are trying to solve that than maybe they should. Um, the suspicion, and there is quite a lot of... Uh, Support for this suspicion is that obviously data is highly structured. So language is not just a, a random succession of words, although in some cases it may seem that. Uh, certainly images, you know, are not random collections of pixels. So the data does not live on a very high <coughs> dimensional space, but lives somewhat in a much smaller subset. And then the amount of data that we now have with modern data sets is perhaps sufficient to constrain these very flexible models enough to predict well where the data is. <coughs> now you might say, great, that's all we need. But, has anyone seen these pictures before? Yes, a few have, a few others haven't. So, uh, I guess this is a bus, a uh, school bus in the US. And uh, this image is classified with high confidence as a bus by a neural network state of the art. This image is classified high confidence by a state-of-the-art neural network as an ostrich. Uh, why is that? Well, that would take a long time perhaps to explain, but when you're playing in very high dimensional spaces, funny things may happen. So you may change a little bit and things change dramatically. That's an open problem. No, no one knows how to solve it. There are several papers that suggest but stop short of the proof, that this is actually an intrinsic feature of deep learning in high dimensions. So we are always going to be vulnerable to, high dimension, to uh, um, what they call adversarial attacks. So let me just wrap up with my, my very final thoughts. As I said, these kind of ideas have been around very much in similar form for a long time. There have been technical advances in the way in which we do the optimization, for example, but they're relatively minor. And you know, if you listen to Jeff Hinton, he would also say the same thing. There have been relatively minor technical advances, but the ideas were there. What has changed is the data and also the hardware, to some extent, the GPUs. Very large amounts of data. 
So if we want to think about societal changes, you know, one can think about big societal changes that we may or may not like. Some of them are <coughs> uh, is somewhat an act of God. Yeah? So if there is an earthquake, it causes a big societal change. It's nobody's fault. But it's not been a dramatic, completely unexpected change in technology that has led to this. It's been that data has become available. Data is a free resource in our society at the moment, which anyone with big computational resources can harvest our data, pretty much. There is very little regulation. I mean, James may want to correct me on these points, but that's the way it has been. And if we want, if we don't like the corollaries of AI, which is really statistics and machine learning, we have to act on thinking that data should not be a free resource, should be something that we should think carefully, regulate. So we should have, uh, you know, for some applications, certainly medical imaging applications, great, as much data as possible. There is a clear tangible benefit to society. For other type of applications, there isn't a clear tangible benefit. For other type of applications, there is a tangible downside to society. So if we want to talk about a high hype, I would prefer to focus rather than on the potential future singularity and things like that, I would like to talk more about the role of data rather than AI algorithms or machine learning and the role we should think about data in terms of how we want to organize ourselves. So I think that's all that I have and uh, thank you very much for uh, listening and I hope I didn't go too much over time. Thank you, Dr. Sanger. That was very insightful.